When it comes right down to it, nuclear energy is vital for the survival of life on Earth. It's the energy that powers the sun and gives us the heat and light we need to thrive. For billions of years, nuclear energy has been produced naturally in every star in the universe. Over the last century, humans have also learned how to generate it, creating some tough questions for society along the way. Nuclear energy gets its name because it involves the central part, or nucleus, of an atom. Scientists discovered that when changes happen to the structure of the nucleus, energy is released. There are two ways this can happen. The first is a process called fission. During fission, the nucleus of an atom splits into two or more parts. The total weight, or mass, of these parts is less than the weight of the original atom. Lost mass gets released as energy. In the other process known as fusion, energy is released when the nuclei of at least two atoms join together. This is how the sun gets its power. Scientists have found a way to create fusion reactions on Earth, and we now regularly use fission in several ways. We've built power plants that produce nuclear energy with machines called nuclear reactors. These reactors provide electricity for about 16% of the world. Nuclear energy is also used in medicine to help scientists diagnose and treat disease. But along with these advantages come dangers of staggering proportions. If nuclear reactions are not controlled, a tremendous amount of energy is released in the form of an explosion. These explosions produce radiation, which harms the cells of the body, causing sickness and even death. This is what happens with nuclear weapons, such as atomic and hydrogen bombs. If properly controlled, nuclear energy has the potential of becoming the most efficient type of energy in the world. Many people believe it will power us into the future when the Earth's other fuels become scarce. But some are concerned about the dangers and would like to see an end to all production of this kind of energy. It's a debate that is sure to continue well into the 21st century. Heat from the sun supplies the Earth with a tremendous amount of energy. It's energy that will last for billions of years. As the Earth's other fuels become scarce, we're learning to put solar energy to use in several ways. At the Rocky Mountain Institute in Snowmass, Colorado, 98% of the building's heat comes from the sun. It's one of the most energy efficient buildings in the world. Plenty of windows let in the sun's heat and light. Inside, a productive greenhouse yields food throughout the year. Plants like banana trees that don't survive in cold climates are able to thrive here. The building also collects energy from the sun with solar panels. They absorb the sun's heat like a small room would on a sunny day. The heat passes into tubes that contain antifreeze. Building resident Andrew Jones explains. This is our passive solar water heater. The bulk of the water heating is done right here where um, the sun heats an antifreeze, which then is pumped down into a huge water tank where we exchange the, the heat with the water in the tank which we use for our showers and for our faucets and residential uses like that. Because sunlight is converted to heat, the system works on the coldest winter day. This would be about 130 or 140 degrees in the middle of winter. Um, midday, about noon in the winter, we can get a lot of heat out of the sun. That's how we heat the whole building. The Rocky Mountain Institute is designed to do more with less. 
Rather than eliminating comforts, it puts the sun's energy to good use throughout the year. Over the last century, we've gone from the horse and buggy to a world teeming with hundreds of millions of automobiles. From the Model T to the latest race cars, one thing remains the same, the internal combustion engine. In these engines, a fine mist of gasoline is sprayed into the piston chamber. When a spark is added, the mixture of air and fuel explodes, driving the piston down and spinning the crankshaft. As the piston moves back up, it pushes the remnants of the explosion out of the piston and the cycle repeats. Take the unburned fuel and carbon monoxide in that exhaust, multiply it by the number of cars on the roads, and you can see why the automobile is considered such a serious threat to the environment. What if we could power our cars with a different sort of reaction? One that runs cheaper and cleaner than any engine yet. Scientists are getting closer to just such a solution. This bus can run at highway speeds over 100 miles at a time. But unlike diesel-powered buses, it runs with no noise and produces only water as its exhaust. It's powered by something called a fuel cell. A fuel cell produces electricity, but it isn't a battery. Instead, hydrogen and air are run on either side of a membrane. The membrane induces the hydrogen and oxygen atoms to combine in a way that produces water and energy. The cell has no moving parts, runs slightly warm to the touch, and as long as hydrogen and air are provided, can't run down like a battery. The idea has been around for a long time, but until recently was too inefficient to be practical. Then one day an engineer at Ballard Systems looked at a new kind of membrane that had been sitting on his workbench for months. When he tested it, he found that the cells produced four times as much power. So far, fuel cell technology is still in the testing stage. And with so much invested in the old gasoline burning technology, it may be a while yet before we drive fuel cell cars. But with the constant threats of rising oil prices and pollution, there's never been a better time for a replacement. One of the most important applications of nuclear energy is in the field of medicine. In nuclear medicine, small amounts of radioactive materials are used to help doctors look at the inside of the body and treat disease. The procedures are safe and non-invasive, and they allow doctors to gather information that might otherwise be unavailable. Nuclear medicine had its start in France in 1902 when scientists Marie and Pierre Curie made a critical discovery. While conducting research on radioactive substances, they found that one substance gave off more radioactivity than others. They determined that the source of this radioactivity was two elements, radium and polonium. Monique Baudry, curator of the Curie Museum in Paris, notes, Les travaux de Pierre et Marie Curie their work was extremely important. The discovery of radium opened up a whole new era. It's been described as the nuclear age. Pierre and Marie were the start of modern physics. Their daughter, Irene Joliet Curie, took their findings even further by developing artificial radiation. She found that by bombarding aluminum with naturally radioactive particles, the aluminum itself became radioactive. 
When particle bombardment ceased, the creation of radioactivity continued. This artificial radioactivity quickly became useful in medicine, and it's still used today to diagnose and treat disease. Dr. Ian Fraser explains. Radiation therapy is a localized treatment of cancer involving external beam radiation and insertion of radioactive materials into the tumor. Radiation therapy was actually in use within a year of the discovery of radiation. Since then, it has become a highly sophisticated treatment of cancer. Of all cancers, radiation is the second most used after surgery. At the time of the Curie's discoveries, the harmful effects of prolonged exposure to radiation were not understood. As seen in this photograph, handling radium produced scarring on Marie Curie's hands. Even worse, repeated contact brought on the cancer leukemia. Both she and Irin died of leukemia before the age of 70. The Curies dedicated their lives to science, and their discoveries continue to prolong life today. Ever wonder why stars are so bright, or how the sun produces so much heat and light? It turns out each star is a giant nuclear furnace that releases energy at its core. It's nuclear energy that lights up the sky. The sun is the star that glows closest to the Earth. It gets its energy by burning gases at its core in a process called fusion. Like most stars, the sun consists almost entirely of two gases, hydrogen and helium. During fusion, hydrogen atoms collide with such strong force that they fuse together to make helium. Each second, 600 million tons of hydrogen convert into 596 million tons of helium. The missing 4 million tons of matter are transformed into energy. This process is only possible because of the enormous heat and pressure found at the center of the sun. It's about 25 million degrees Fahrenheit in there. Energy moves from the center to the surface of the sun with dramatic results. The most spectacular sight is an enormous explosion of energy known as a solar flare. These flares send radioactive particles into space, particles that get carried by solar winds. They reach the Earth in a day or two where they're deflected by the Earth's magnetic field. But at the North and South Poles, these particles can hit the Earth's atmosphere and produce brilliant light shows known as auroras. While not everyone has a chance to see an aurora, all of us certainly experience the sun's energy each day. At 93 million miles away, we are far enough removed from this star to enjoy the benefits of its heat and light. During photosynthesis, plants collect energy from the sun's light and use it to make food. Like every star, someday the sun will run out of the gases that fuel it and gradually fade away. Astronomers believe the sun is more than four billion years old and has already burnt up about half of the hydrogen at its core. But no need to worry, it still has about five billion more years to go. The nuclear energy that powers every star seems almost inexhaustible, and for that reason, scientists would like to find a way to generate it on Earth. But that's a tall order. It requires them to duplicate and control the same conditions found at the center of the sun. Scientists are working on ways to do just that.
Energy in the form of heat from the sun is the engine that powers our weather. Heat not only gives us warm weather, it also leads to tornadoes, hurricanes, blizzards, and rain. Sounds impossible? Just think about the sun. It pours out electromagnetic energy in all directions, all the time. It radiates heat waves that travel through space and reach the surface of the Earth. Energy from the sun gets absorbed by the Earth and converted to heat. Since our Earth is tilted, sunlight strikes it unevenly. At any given time, some places on Earth are heated more strongly than others. This uneven heating helps drive our weather. As the surface of the Earth heats up, it heats the air above it. Like these bubbles, warmer air becomes thinner and lighter, so it rises. And as it does, cooler air moves in to take its place. This movement of heat through the fluid of air is known as convection. It creates areas of high pressure and low pressure and gives us our winds, even tornadoes. We can think of our atmosphere as an endlessly moving river of air, full of currents, eddies, and winds. Together with water, it helps distribute heat around the planet. Water both retains and releases the heat energy from the sun. So it too plays a key role in our weather. The oceans efficiently store heat and carry both warm and cold water around the globe. The differences in heat between the land and sea greatly influence local weather. To get a better idea of how water carries heat, just look at a puddle. When the sun heats the puddle, the water evaporates carrying heat energy with it. Water becomes invisible vapor that adds moisture to the air. This water vapor rises until it cools and condenses into clouds that bring snow and rain. Stored heat energy is released in the process, which sometimes powers a thunderstorm. The energy released when water vapor turns into a thunderstorm is mind-boggling. It could power New York City for two months if only we could harness it. There's that old saying, if you don't like the weather, wait a minute, it'll change. Thanks to the heat of the sun, this is definitely the case.